It's We're Live on YouTube, Q&A with Dima. It's, the program is called Transformation, the Art of Reinvention in the Time of the Pandemic. This afternoon, I'm joined by an old friend, a wonderful American soprano living in Germany for many years, Nadine Sekunde. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. You're speaking to us from Wiesbaden. <laughs> yeah. Which of course, that's where we met in 82 when my wife Susan Roberts got the position there and we moved to Wiesbaden. Now, I know a lot about you from 82, but tell me what happened before. You were born and raised in Ohio and tell me about your upbringing and uh, whether was there any music in the family? How, how did you become a musician, singer and so forth? Yeah, uh, it's funny with a lot of singers, I find that they skip a generation. There's very often grandparents that were musical and I had two grandmas that were musical, um, but my dad was a, uh, uh, he fixed cars and my mom was a nurse, but somehow we all sang. Um, the idea that one could make money at singing was totally new, who, who did that? So when I went to college, I studied music education and piano, which by the way, I can recommend for any singers because it so helps if you can actually, you know, play your own music and don't have to depend on somebody else all the time. And when I went to Oberlin, um, one of the requirements was that you had to do an ensemble, which everybody hated. You had to sing in the choir or you had to, one of the things, ways you could get out of that was to accompany. So I said, that's what I'll do. I'll play for a voice class. I can do that. Um, and I went into the voice class to play for these, you know, singers, vocal majors. You know, they were the, the elite. And uh, I listened to what was going on in the class. And I just thought, well, it's just, it's not, this could be fun. You know, why not? Right. Um, and so I ended up singing for Mr. Hatton, who was the voice class person and he said yeah well we can take you on and so to make a long story short by the time I graduated I had a, a, a actually almost a triple major in piano voice and music education it took me five years but I had it and as far as I was concerned I was going to go back to Ohio and teach high school music um, and then somebody told me about this teacher in Indiana who was supposed to be magical so um, basically what happened was my roommate packed me up in her car and said, we're going to Indiana because we're going to study voice. And the rest just kind of happened. Uh, we ended up staying there for a year because you can get state fees if you live in the, sit in the state of Indiana. And you don't have to pay full fees. You can just pay in-state fees, which is thousands of dollars cheaper. So that's what we did. I worked in um, a restaurant and a library for a year. And at the end of the year, I went and sang for Margaret Harshaw. And uh, yeah, that's and that's kind of how things happened. But it was like, I don't know how it is for most American singers. But for me, there was never the question of actually being an opera singer. I was going to be a teacher who sings, you know, or I was going to go to New York and sing sing in a choir or something like that. But the idea of going to Europe and actually making money at this didn't happen until I met somebody who knew how to do that, which was my teacher. She said, you got to go to Europe. Uh, I said, oh, that's that's a fine idea. Now tell me how to, how to finance that, please. <laughs> and so she said, yeah, well, there's scholarships. You just have to you know, get yourself busy and apply for some. So uh, that's what I did. Um, even today, when I talk to young singers about scholarships, there's a lot of them that don't even know that you can go to Europe for free if you get a certain scholarship from the States. And it doesn't even have to be a Fulbright. It can be a DAAD, it can be a Rotary scholarship. There's money available to go to Europe. You just have to dig around in the internet to find it. Back when I was there, we didn't even have an internet. We just had to write to everybody. But I did, and I got ended up with the Fulbright, which actually is an academic scholarship. It's not a music scholarship. But you could study music. And um, in the in the Hochschule, I say, in the conservatory that took me, which was in Stuttgart, they had a program which I thought was magical, where an agent actually came and listened to the singers. 
And he came and listened to me and he sent me to a theater and it was Wiesbaden. And it was, yeah, I know. When I tell people that story to my young singers today, they just go, it must've been so easy back then. I said, you know, it really was easier. It really was easier than it is now. I think also it, it must've been easier uh, from the point because my story is just the opposite of yours because uh, if I was not gonna be one of the top soloist i was i was going to be a failure because i was the son of <laughs> because of your family of so course that, that yeah. just ruins you know because the expectations are way 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 yeah uh, yeah it's crazy yeah then then the reality but uh the, for you what's wonderful that you since your expectations were really very well zero, <laughs> <laughs> zero there were zero yeah yeah, everything was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> yeah, everything was just like discovery. Oh, I can yeah. do this. Oh, so maybe yeah. I try this. But yeah, you know, Fulbright, you must have been a really brilliant student, though. I mean, you have to have a really good grade average to get a Fulbright. Yeah, yeah. but you also, and this is, I was just talking to my daughter about this because she's an, uh, she's writing her doctorate now, and we talk a lot about writing proposals, and you can write a proposal that you think will get your message across or you can write a proposal that you think they want to hear uh -huh. and you i think you have to be really quite shameless about that i wanted to go to germany so i wrote this entire document about how you had to speak german and understand the german culture to sing wagner which is what i wanted to do i mean i believed all that Exactly. That kind of wasn't the main reason I wanted to go to Germany, but it sounded really good. You know, consider your audience when you write such a proposal, what they would want to hear. That's that's a great advice to the to the young ones, because, you know, one doesn't uh, you know, so many uh, people or fans or famous singers, your illustrious colleague, for instance, uh, Renee Fleming, first time we met her at a festival and uh susan was there and of course you know susan staying after he's but in frankfurt uh, for three years and uh, renee says oh i know you i i heard you a number of times how would you so that because i was i was on a scholarship for studying a year in frankfurt uh, uh she studied with arlene auger she had nothing yeah. to do with frankfurt opera but she went to every performance and she rolled off you know the, oh you were in the seraglio you were in this and that so you see, yeah, that's how you get into it. And very few people even know that, uh, you know, recently uh, passed away great uh, Jesse Norman was in Gelsenkirch. You know, that I tried to find that on the map. That's definitely not the glamorous. <laughs> you know. It's the Detroit of Wiesbaden, basically. Yeah, I mean, Detroit <laughs> used to be a great city. Gelsenkirch was never a great city. <laughs> oh, don't tell them about that. Don't oh, tell no. them about their football team. Then. Wiesbaden yeah. is the, was the city of millionaires before the war. I mean, Wiesbaden is very beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It, it is. A lot of people laugh and call it the Beverly Hills of Germany. And it kind of is. It's a kind of a snooty little town. Oh, yeah. But it is. It was never big on the cultural map. I mean, you do have to go to Frankfurt or, uh, you know, one of the bigger places to do that. I mean, we had a certain amount of culture going on. but So easy. So, so we never moved to Frankfurt. Once Susan got a position of, uh, in Frankfurt, we stayed in Wiesbaden. It was was within half an hour. She was a day. She was sometimes twice a day in, in Frankfurt theater and came back. You yeah, know, sure. Even, even your next stop, a Cologne, was not that far. Well, the commute. I used to drive home after performances, sure. You and know, after that, the airport was a half an hour from our house. That right? was the, the best time. I, That's the, the time great remember, stuff. 20 minutes door to door a yep. traffic, no traffic those days you can kiss goodbye now <laughs> you, have well. to, you have to be prepared for i mean with now with covid and everything i mean it's it's like a siege mentality you have to camp out at the <laughs> airport and wait for this and wait for that and then maybe it'll go maybe it won't it's yeah a, it's a different it's a different story tell me uh, it was it was there also a period when many because I know on the sort of on the receiving end that's how I met Susan of course but there were many wonderful uh, American singers coming to Germany to Europe in general were there any of your class in Oberlin or Indiana any of the colleagues that we we might know uh, studying with you at that time 
Oh, that that and it, well, if I told you their names, you probably wouldn't know them. But they were working singers. They were working. Um, you know, there there was a whole class of people who ended up in maybe not Munich, but in Karlsruhe or right. Stuttgart. Right. who, uh, you know, you wouldn't know them from recording or something, but they made a living at it. Uh, great, uh, you know. I would have to think about from Indiana, I mean, we did have people like Benita Valente. We had people like, um, I mean, in our class, uh, Kevin Lang and Sally Wolf. I mean, people who did make careers. Wow. Um, but the, the broad mass of them actually ended up in houses like Mannheim and sang for years and years. And um, I don't think there's too many studios in the States right now that can say, like of my graduating class from Indiana, probably 80% of them went on to work yeah. in their chosen field of opera, Destiny. which was, which is practically not findable today, unfortunately. Yeah. Partly because the market has changed and part, just partly because people don't um, invest in the careers anymore that much. I mean, they try to, they try to stay home. And do the career and also i think the the field uh, has changed because uh you know now you have a lot of europeans uh, east europeans coming coming at oh, that sure. time at yeah. that time it was still before the wall came down you know and and you have a lot more uh you know a lot more uh for coming from orient you know, from Korea. Oh, yeah, from Korea and because China, just, even Japan. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. true. Now I, I meet when I hear Julia singing in Handorf and Dresden, I see a lot of, you know, Russians, uh, Polish singers, whatever, and also from Korea and so forth. It, they, there weren't as many at that time. So, uh, no. Susan is reminding me of a name maybe that escaped you, uh, Cheryl Studer. Was she oh gosh, yes, she was an Oberlin girl. Yeah, she was yeah, of course, she yeah, was yeah. a huge star. Of course, back back yes. then, yeah, 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 yeah. we saw. It. Yeah, so, and once you you came to Wiesbaden, that was a whole new. How did you how did you adjust? Because it is a cultural shock in a good way, but it is. Well, I think I had it a little bit easier in the fact that I'd already been a year in Germany and been through this full by program, and I already spoke the language to some extent um, and had kind of figured out that, yes, you have to, you know, clean your steps in front of your apartment. And yes, the door handles are different and the toilets are different. And, you know, you better not cross on a green light, you know, like you do in New York. There were just a lot of things that I was really used to about Germany and came to appreciate about Germany. Um, so the adjustment, I think, for me was not as horrible the first year when I was uh, at, at the down in the Goethe Institute in Rosenheim, that that was a major adjustment. I mean, coming directly from the states to Rosenheim, which is like you know teeny little Bavarian city, and going into this Goethe program, which throws you in with people, and you're not allowed to speak your native language with them. Who, you know, you get a roommate who's Italian and you better speak German with them. So it was, it was, that was intense. That was an intense three months, but that was the worst of it. After, after that, things got a little bit easier. Um, and there was a, a major click of American singers at Wiesbaden that time. We had a, it, it's, I don't even know if this kind of situation exists in Germany anymore today. It was an ensemble that played together that, you know, really socialized together. That was a, a group of friends. I mean, I know that there are uh, ensembles in Germany, but the fact that we were almost all Americans made a huge difference. It was like a club, you know. Um, similar situation in Cologne, not quite as intense, but but in 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 Wiesbaden, we were practically all in our first year contracts. We were all new. We were all holding each other's hands and playing you know, scrabble together and stuff. And it was a lot of those friendships lasted forever. You know, that it was, you know, one of those really intense times that you uh, just enjoy in, in the, that ensemble system. I would wish every young singer to have a couple of years of that because it's the difference between thinking singing is this thing you do only on weekends 
and under enormous amounts of preparation and seeing singing as a job. If you're in an ensemble and something gets canceled, you go down and sing. I mean, they say, we're putting on Bartered Bright tonight, so put on your braids and come on down. And you you know, it could be four o'clock in the afternoon and that, that stuff happens in an ensemble situation. Um, and it gives you this security for life about um, being flexible and be, and uh, not thinking every night is a premiere. Because there's some nights that just, you know, are not going to go the way you want them to go. And because we're in V-Spot, it probably won't mean the end of my career. <laughs> so, and it's, that is a, such a wonderful experience. I, I would, you know, really recommend it for anybody who has a chance of going into an ensemble system. Because it just is a, it's a basis for your whole career then. You never really uh, have the kind of nerves, I think, that people have that don't do that because you understand it's a job. It's a great career, but it's also a job. You do it, you know, when, you know, when you have to do it, you do it. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And I think I, I remember also those years in Wiesbaden, which of course combined in Susan's case, two years in Wiesbaden and then three years in Frankfurt, but we stayed in Wiesbaden and we continued and the friendship with you goes back there. Uh, but it was also at that time, we we used to even go, there were, there were a lot of Americans in town because of the American air base. We used yeah, to go, also go and show mm -hmm. sometimes in that in that air base being. American. Yeah, they used to let you in there. Now they don't anymore, of course. <laughs> but, of course but they used to in the good old days. Yeah, yeah. no, it was just a, a much a much different time, much less pressure. Yeah. Um, I I'm sure we were all in our own ways ambitious, but we were all very happy to be where we were right then. It was great to be young and. We thought we were talented and, you know, we were having a great time and there were other things that were important, you know, meeting people in the orchestra and stuff like that. It was um, it was fun. It was fun to be a singer. And yeah. I'm not sure young singers always are finding that these days. It, it seems to us anyway, to the, to the old folks, to the older folks, that it's it's so easy to fall into, oh, in our times and this and that. But there are some objective reasons why to say, you know, the field was more different. Open. Yeah, it was different. And it, it was different. more open. It didn't seem so, you know, so... Well, you weren't, you know, okay, there were pirate recordings, but you weren't, you know, nobody was recording every single you know, fart that you made on stage like they do now. You know, you couldn't, you didn't do a bad performance and see it next day on YouTube because nobody had that kind of technology back then. You know, Absolutely. it was, there was much less pressure. Yeah. And unless you were uh, really being recorded, which was extremely unusual because it was a big deal and very illegal and everything like that. You just didn't have this danger of always showing up somewhere where you didn't want to show up because you made a mess, you know, it was, um, I don't think we took the whole thing quite so seriously as people do now because they know, you know, in a good way. It was was less pressure. The microphone was not always just hanging in front. Yeah, of you. no, you know, hardly or ever. <laughs> or picking up or now, you know, you go to any place, and all they do, it seems like they they forget to experience whatever wherever they are. They're just taking pictures, pictures, yeah. or little videos. Everybody, it's like. Nobody, you know, when there is political or a cultural event, everybody's with the phone. Just re remember it with your eyes. You know, just soak yeah, it in. Yeah, be in the moment. <laughs> be in the moment, exactly. It's, it's not going to be bit. a picture anyway. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's not what it is. I mean, I like to take pictures when I go on my walks in various places. And, you know, whatever my friends on Facebook or wherever, they, they like to see my pictures. That's fine. But, but I take a walk and then I might take a picture of a lovely Christmas market. Now, when the old Christmas markets were canceled in town, yeah. they had it. So why shouldn't I take a picture? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but it wasn't like, you know, you come out of your, it's like paparazzi. Everybody became paparazzi these days. You yes. Know? Yeah. In a way, in a way. Let's, yeah. move, let's move on to uh, something that became very important for you because one of your uh, sort of the staple of your repertoire, of course, was 
even before you came to Germany was the interest in Wagner. And then you ended up singing a lot of Wagner. So let's God speak knows. with Wagner and, and tell us about Bayreuth. Well, to quote John Tomlinson, Sir John, now it's like being in hell. <laughs> 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 no, I, it's Bayreuth is, um, it's, it's a, a melting pot. It's a, it's like being in a, in a blacksmith shop and getting beat on every day, basically, especially if you're there with people like Kupfer and Barnboim. But, you know, it's, uh, it's incredibly intense. I, I, I find myself talking about it like people who went through the Second World War talk about the Second World War. You know, it's just like, oh, well, we just sweated every day and we were, you know, wearing these furs and everybody, we rehearsed nine hours a day and Harry would keep screaming at us. And it was, but I mean, like most things that are incredibly educational, they hurt a little while they're happening. And this hurt, you know, it hurt a lot. The first summer was uh, actually quite namby-pamby because that was the summer that um, Werner Herzog was doing the Lohengrin. Oh, yeah. Yes, which was beautiful that was and role. that was your first role. There. That was the first that, role. That, which, they loved it. Yeah, yeah, and he did this beautiful fairy tale thing. And his main question, a lot of times during the rehearsals, was were, were things like, "Oh, that looks like what? What do you usually do there?" <laughs> so we, we, and we would do that, you know. And he was happy, and he and his crew had rented a magical ruin of a castle outside of Bayreuth, and they had star-studded parties with lots of, you know, alcohol. It was just magical to even be close to a personality like that. I mean, he would sit down and tell you about the time he was across the ice floe from a polar bear. And it was just like, I, it was, you, you just couldn't, you know, couldn't look away. Um, and he was, I, I adore that man. I laughed so hard when I saw him in The Mandalorian. I just thought, oh my God, Werner, what are you doing there? <laughs> it's just so funny to see him again. Yeah. And this was the summer, if you had to get a, get used to Bayreuth, this was the way to do it. With somebody who was very low pressure and very kind, Peter Schneider, who was the world's kindest conductor. Um, and that was fine until the end came and I got sick for the premiere, which was famous in its own way. Um, but the second summer was the Barn Boy Cook for Team. And that was a completely different experience. I mean, those guys, whoa, you know, they they put us through our paces. Um, it I think it ended up being one of the places that I learned the most about how to sing and what I was actually capable of doing on stage. And I was very lucky because I was relatively young when that happened. I was relatively young and to be in Bayreuth at all. And it um, it changed the way that I looked at singing forever. Unfortunately, it also set an incredibly high standard of what opera can be. And didn't get really close to that very often again. Uh, it was, there is a way to make opera a living, breathing thing that jumps off the stage and grabs you by the throat. And he could always do that, even if you didn't like a lot of what was going on. But yeah, and you get a little spoiled. It, I think it's probably like what you must have experienced working with a great conductor when you were like 12 or whatever. Yeah. You know? And also, yes, uh, you know, I played, my first trip was, was to uh, Prague at 12, exactly at 12. And Rudolfinum for me, is always, always it. one of the, the most standard. Beautiful. And then the first place I went when I immigrated was Vienna uh, Musikverein. And I was standing <laughs> in the back. I told Pinkas to come on and Jamie Laredo, whose concert it was. Yeah. And I, I, all I could afford was standing in the back of the, of the, the 200 shillings. Yeah, I mean, I was a poor emigre. I, I was in yeah. Vienna for eight days before being shipped down to Rome for three months of, you know. And I heard that in that golden hall, it was just something. Yeah. And little did I know that uh, just uh, two years later, I'll be on, on stage winning the Chrysler competition in that very hall. You know? <laughs> but yeah. at that point, it just seemed so, so it's like a holy grail. And yeah. Inky, he was just incredibly wonderful. And I thought, mm. I came from a rather 
prominent uh, violin country, you know, that I've heard in yeah, my, yeah, in my yeah. time. But is everybody like this? That was an extraordinary performance. As long as I live, I will never forget it. Because, you know, it's the first first thing you have and all that. So Bayreuth must be like this. I remember, well, yeah. I remember Bayreuth also the acoustics are so perfect for Wagner's operas. I mean, the yes. singers are just never covered. Just never. Yeah, no, never. Yeah, yeah. And and it, and working with a team like that sets you up for life with extremely high standards. And uh, even in houses and, and after Bayreuth, because you get your stamp of Bayreuth on you, and pretty much you start working in bigger places after that. And even in the really wonderful places that I did work with, that kind of, you know, just energy and, and commitment to a production, it, it just doesn't happen that, that often. But that's okay. You know, it's all right. Susan used to call that place Camp Wagner. <laughs> in, a way, in a way, it was, it wasn't. It? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, sure. It's, it's a, some kind of a musical, artistic, religious cult. It is. It's a cult, yeah. definitely. It's and of cult. course, the we, the ones who were singing uh, the big roles, were always very jealous of the ones who were singing the small roles. Uh, you know, the Knappens and these and that, because they were having a great time. They were in the cantina, drinking afterwards and going on hikes and everything. And we were in our rooms going, oh, I think I have a sore throat. Oh, my God, I'm getting, you know, the whole, the, oh, it's the Bayreuth, curse of Bayreuth, which is the climate, you know. I might get sick. I'm not, no, I can't possibly go out for a glass of wine because I might get sick, you know. So, yeah, they, those guys had the best time, actually. Yeah, of course. Now, obviously, that was a place where you first also came across some some of the biggest names among the conductors and, and you worked with, with great colleagues and everything. What uh, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, your experiences, let's say, with big, big names like Barenboim, Scholte, and then later uh, Tielemann, which is, of course, now a big, a big name in the, in the, you know, in that particular repertoire. Oh, so yeah. what, what did you learn? What was the sort of revelatory, interesting that you could, bring home what, what you could take home from them? You know, it, even these huge personalities, and they are huge personalities that do opera. Oh, yeah. um, the conductors also. I mean, they, they don't just do opera, of course. All of these people that you mentioned do concerts and are the stars sometimes. Um, but when they get in the pit, I, I think that I'm not alone in feeling this way. If they are beyond wonderful or beyond excellent, you don't feel like you're singing at all. It's like they're taking care of everything. You are so supported, helped, um, nurtured when you need to be. Um, and it is, there's a complete subjection of the personality of this enormous personality to the moment and not everybody can do that that's what makes among other things the three people that you just mentioned so special because these are you know mm, huge egos all of all three of them i mean yeah. uh and and but this at the moment that they are doing opera i don't know how it is with concerts because never did a concert with them Oops. but at the moment that so they do operas they are at the let's say, at the service of the singer and at the service of the piece. And it's, um, it's, a, it's very amazing to watch this happen, um, especially somebody like, I mean, I do, I love Christian Tielemann. I've always loved him. And, you know, to see him rant and rave during rehearsals and really, and then say, oh, throw a coach off the bench and say, you don't know how to play this piece and sit down and play Rosen Cavalier without the music and things like that. You just go, oh, wow. And on the evening, you, you know, he hears the first three notes of the trio in Rosen Cavalier. What do I know? And hears, oh, she's not at her best tonight. And all of a sudden he's just like, you know, no, we'll, we'll, we'll just, you know, come on, I'll just let me do it. Let me do it. I, I, I'll help you sing this. And that's an opera conductor. You know, and I, that is a unique gift. And I don't think all conductors can do that. 
Yeah. And clearly it doesn't have anything to do with their opinion of themselves because they these guys all think they're God on earth, you know, and some and so do I to some extent. But at the moment when they're there for you, they are unbelievably uh, for you there, you know, just complete subjection. It's wonderful. Music takes over and, and it's all about just making the best out of this piece and, and we're there together. And so yeah. if you need help, and, we'll help and you. You know, also knowing, having the ears to recognize when and if you need help or if you're having a good evening. You know, um, when I was first studying Arabella, I had the amazing good fortune to meet and work with the first Arabella, which was Romanian, I think her, I think she was Romanian, Viorica Urzuleac, who was the partner of uh, Krauss for many years and the one of the Strauss sopranos. And she did the first Arabella. She was very old when I met her, like 92 or something. And she had sung many Arabellas with Strauss. And I asked her, you know, what, well, what was, you know, she said, well, I didn't even notice he was there uh, most of the time. And uh, if I was having a really good evening, he would let me hold out the high notes much longer than they were written. And I just laughed so hard. I just thought about doing that in a modern performance. <laughs> You know, and just have somebody down there. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know, if you're having a good night. Hold that thing out. Enjoy. You know, it was. It? That's that's to me the ultimate story of of orchestra of you know opera conducting. Yeah, because a lot of people forget that Strauss was a very important conductor, opera conductor, and also he was for a few years the music director of the Berlin Philharmonic, no less. And he premiered some important, for instance, violin, uh, Sibelius Violin Concerto was conducted by him, uh, you know, when, when sure. it was premiered. He also conducted in Weimar, the premiere of Hansel and Gretel. That was Richard Strauss, you know? So it's interesting what we've got something, wish there were more of those conductors uh, today for as well yeah yeah today there's just uh, for sure very very few of those isn't it yeah it's a yeah well i'm not sure if that's the way conductors are trained because all of these people grew up under the piano basically either they either they were coaches or they were their parents were uh, singers or something i mean they they really grew up with that sound and that sense of breath in, in their bodies already. And so when they went to opera conducting, it was not a difficult transition. Um, the one that nobody ever talks about anymore, who was in Vienna for a hundred years, was a guy named Klobuchar. Oh, yeah. And if you say his name to any singer, it's just like, oh, he was the god of all gods, you know, who was just probably as good as any of the other people we've talked about, but just simply not ambitious. And he was also, if, if he was in the pit, you just think, okay, well, I'll, I'll chime in when I feel like it, you know, but basically he's singing for you, you know, it was amazing. And the way he had to I was lucky, uh, I think it may, may have been my very first visit to Japan because he used to go there and he was much, uh, you know, appreciated and valued in Japan. And I think I played Mendelssohn concerto with Klobuchar conducting, I'm pretty sure. Could yeah. have been 1985 or something like that. No, what about, yeah, yeah about that time. Right. Yeah. Lovely man, very, very beautiful. It's a real Kapellmeister. But yes. the other one that I played a great deal, I loved him uh, as a, as a, as an orchestral conductor, but I think he was even better in opera, was Horst Stein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, oh, yeah, he was... He yeah, was, a very, very Straussian technique, you know, just, you know, very, you know, handcuffed, but uh, incredibly, incredibly helpful. Uh, yeah, really not known really as an opera conductor uh, over yeah. symphony, but he could, had a yeah. good tenor <laughs> voice, had a good tenor voice because when I didn't know that. When, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I heard him actually singing to somebody who was saving it or I said, I'll, I'll sing it. And he had. <laughs> He was a personality. Oh boy, he was very strong, but fantastic uh, collaborator. He was. Yeah. Wonderful. I did so many different concerti with him. He was just, yeah. you know, and. Uh, big, but he could be tough. Oh he yeah, be, he, and he was tough. very sort of, in his way, very cynical in the in the in the right way. You know, I remember once we were doing something what we're doing now. You know, interview. 
And he said, yeah, okay, so now that we've done that verbal strip tease, let's move on and have lunch or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in some ways, and <laughs> you have to agree with him because there is an element of that. You know, he <laughs> didn't mince words. He didn't yeah, well, words. I prefer to think of it as a verbal tennis match yeah, rather than tennis a verbal match, Yes, it could be. But say, well, yeah, yeah, because... People, there are some people who don't want to talk about those things and open up. So yeah. have, now that we've done that verbal strip tease, let's go and have lunch. So <laughs> <laughs> it was after the rehearsal, somebody came just to interview, not online in those days. You know, we're talking about yeah. Basel, Basel, early 80s when we lived in, in Wiesbaden. I could just get in a car and, and three hours later I was in Basel. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could still do that if you hadn't moved. I, uh, <laughs> I can hear Susan laughing all the way from the other room now. <laughs> Speaking of Strauss, just I, I don't know whether I ever told you. I, I once spent three hours talking to Peter Strauss, his grandson. Grandson, in, yeah. In in Garmisch. And he and, and I asked him, I said, Peter, isn't that amazing when you watch uh your grandfather conducting, you know, his just doesn't move at all, doesn't express any. But what's interesting, he reaches for his pocket watch, he looks at it, and then he starts conducting visibly faster. So <laughs> what was it? He said, you know, he want, didn't want to be late for a card game. A scotch game, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I said, why cards? He said, well, he, and this is very, very uh, rare information. He said, you know, in all he, he suffered all his waking hours, he could not stop the music going through his head. It drove mm. him crazy all the time. The only time it stopped when he started playing cards. So for him, that was the only relaxation he could have. Mm. from music so when he saw a oh, card game forget and in the meantime Zaratustra or whatever Oxygen, <laughs> just blah, 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 let's get it over with <laughs> move it along yeah. yeah yeah for him you know it was it did normally conductors just get so you know like birds uh, take a bath in it yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> uh, I performed with a number of and you know he was just Mr. Cool and let's get it over with yeah <laughs> so, don't get too excited. My card game is waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hey, well. It... Hey. Now, let's move to something else. Um, apart from uh, Wagner and obviously Strauss, because you've done quite a lot of Janacek, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, and yet I felt like I really never did it until the last four or five years of my career, because yeah. although I did it earlier, we always did it in German. Complete Janoszczyk cycle in Cologne, but all in German. It was all uh, That was just used to be how things were done. I mean, there were decent translations, yeah. but of course it's a translation and it's not uh, probably what they had. we had a wonderful Janacek Cyclus uh, um, cycle in Cologne, also Kupfer, very intense. That, that's actually where I met him. Uh, Helga Dernisch and I were doing our first Katya with him, and uh, and Helga was quite a you know she was a personality in her own right, and she was talking about the entrance of the Kabanicha. and she said um, I really feel like she should have a prayer book in her hands. And Harry looked at her and said, no, I don't think so. And that was the end of it. Just like, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, that was that was the pissing contest. Pissing contest over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Harry won. <laughs> so that was just, there's the rules. No. So, and it was after, but, but he, you know, he was totally convincing as a, as a director in every respect. So we all, um, you know, adored him. But it that was the, I'm not sure that cycle started in about 1985. And even a house which was a major German house at that time, which Cologne really was, was still doing the Janacek stuff in German, yeah. which seems kind of shocking to us today. But yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I've done, you know, other uh, productions now in Czech. And it's, oh my God, that's a hard language even to get approximately right. Yeah. 
um, it, it's a real dilemma because, you know, you feel like you want to do it and in the way that it was written. And yet it's so hard to get right in the way that it was written. You know, you see uh, five consonants and it's a word and you say, okay, so how do I sing that? Um, so I don't, I do understand why people even now in Germany are actually going back to doing it in German sometimes. So, but uh, long story short answer, um, I didn't really come up against the, the Czech form of Janacek until much later, which was the Frankfurt production of Yenufa, which was pretty epic. Um, great, uh, great cast. Til Tilman Knabe was the director. I think, um, I'm pretty sure Sebastian Weigler was already at, as the game day then. Um, very, very gripping cast. And that was the first time I'd ever done anything in Czech. And it was just like, oh, wow, this makes everything so much harder. But yeah, um, you know, um, it's interesting. We took a tour of actually Katya to, uh, I think it was Prague and Brno and everything like that. And me being, you know, the music historian person that I am, I said, I'm going to go to Janicek's house. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> it was like I kept asking people where it was. And they said, well, you have to make an appointment because nobody's there. And this was like going to Bonn and having somebody say, uh, Beethoven House? No, we don't have one of those. <laughs> it's just like so strange. So strange. He's, he's really not that well known in, in his own country not as nearly as often performed as he is in Germany. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I'm sure this is changing, but... Yeah, they yeah. seem to, to, to get, uh, they seem to have gotten stuck on Dvorak and Smetana. And that's yeah. it. And it's always yeah. from Dvorak or Smetana. And Janacek in many countries is, uh, in England, uh, played all the time and stayed yeah. and one of the major yeah. composers. And what you said, of course, in his case, I would certainly support uh, the idea because he worked even in his violin sonata, which I played and recorded and I love it. And, you know, he, he's a, he wrote music like a speech. You know, so, yeah. so his music is is based on speech patterns. So I would imagine doing him uh, doing his uh, opera in his native Czech. That probably just feels right. On the other hand, if I think of Shostakovich, who actually uh, went on record and said a number on number of occasions that he felt that operas should be done in the language of where it is. In other words, like ENO, English National, they do it in English because people could actually understand it. And, mm. and I'll tell you, I, I heard Julia doing, uh, you know, my daughter, Julia Sitkevetsky, who sang uh, Queen of the Night in English, you know, with it, with this going, you get the humor of it. Yes, it's mm. not what, what Mozart wrote, but it appeals and people laugh when they're supposed to laugh and they know what's going on. There is something about that as well. You know, so it's hard no. to say, you know, if, if, if you are a listener, I, I mean, do you always follow the surtitles? Or, you know, if you don't know the story or even if you do know the story, can you follow the ring and really mm -hmm. understand what's going on there? You know, oh. if you actually respond to the language as it's being sung well there's i mean i go back and forth around that with arguments as well because of course um with certain orchestrations including wagner and also janicek uh you're not going to understand most of the people on stage anyway <laughs> That's so why don't we just do it even if everybody's check is not absolutely perfect Let's just do it and throw up those super titles. I mean, even now in Germany, if they're doing Electra, they put the text on the super titles because you, I mean, that orchestra, you're just, you don't understand anybody. Yeah, believe it's me. a completely, you know, I mean, you have to project so much sound and who the hell is going to worry about text, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think, yeah, you got to check. We'll get our very best go of trying to duplicate as much of a Czech sound as we can and let people read it, you know. Uh, uh, it's a little unfortunate because, of course, all you see, you know, are the nostrils uh, of the cat. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Which is kind of a problem. It does help now that I've been going, you know, we've lived in London all these years. And, and of course, in the Royal Opera House, 
they have quite, you know, important uh, surtitles because a lot of operas now, I really do know this story and I kind of understand what's going on in, in, in the ring after all this year. Oh, good for you. <laughs> you should you should do a whole broadcast on that. Yeah, Explain it to us. Yeah. And get people completely confused. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but um, let's move on to today's uh, situation. What was it like for you the last year? You probably couldn't really travel much anywhere. And well, um, actually, lockdown. until yeah. this third wave, I was traveling pretty much wherever I wanted to because I, um, actually had COVID uh, at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. and uh, not a bad case of it. I mean, maybe quite, uh, I was in bed for three or four days and it took me a while to get over it, but it wasn't, I mean, I thought I had a flu. I didn't know I had it. Um, like so that was, that that whole thing was, I felt like I was looking at that situation from a completely different angle as most people, because I was just, you know, I, I wasn't worried about anything, about getting sick again. Um, I was traveling very frequently, had my very own railroad car to myself, you know, yes. um, and it wasn't until they started to close the schools that I was teaching at that anything got fairly seriously, which happened, you know, about halfway through the whole pandemic. Um, so it, I don't feel like uh, life changed for me that much. Listening to most of your broadcasts, and I think I mentioned this to Susan too, what I found so fascinating about it was the difference between what the men were saying and what the women were saying. Because, you know, the men were, were had their noses pressed up against the glass going, <laughs> when can we do what we do again? I'm so, you know, I can't, I'm so frustrated. Um, and the women were going, oh, let's talk about our relationship. <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about our, our, our spiritual work. We can do yoga. You know, it was um, it's such a difference in basic what they call men line, vibe line stuff in 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 uh, how people react to these kind of, um, you know, uh, things that you, you know, you get closed into doing. And if you enclose a guy, he's going to want out. And, you know, a lot of the women are saying, well, okay, we're stuck. So what can we do uh, on inner work? I found that so fascinating. Um, and I, I mean, let's just face it. At this point in the game, everybody's sick of doing everything else. If it's inner work or yoga or meditation or, uh, you know, interviews or whatever, we're just all really tired of it um and i have to say hats off to england because you guys are paving the way you know you're giving the rest of us all hope that there might be a life uh, afterwards what pertains to the theater um scene in germany uh yeah uh, there's two schools of thought over here the one is that once those doors open up again you're not going to be able to get a ticket because people are just going to go running into the theater. They're just so hungry for live entertainment. And the other, unfortunately, is that they've got used to streaming yeah. and have become a little more content not to go out in the evening and why should I get dressed up and uh, that sort of thing. And I find it really hard to say which way, you know, the oh. it's going to jump. Yeah. Um, I know that people can't wait to go back to restaurants and, and get out. Yeah. So I hope very much that that is going to pertain to theater life as well. And everybody that I know has plans for the second that the doors open, you know, to do small productions, you know, they're, they're all set to go. Um, so we just have to wait and see how the, how the public is going to react. I mean, I can certainly imagine a certain amount of, older people thinking, yeah, you know, uh, we can watch it at home too. And unfortunately, those are the stable of our audience in Wiesbaden anyway. So I just hope that things go well. Not, not only Wiesbaden, I think anywhere. Uh, and, you know, I just talked to a major festival director uh, who's presenting, you know, risking to have his festival in the summer. I said, well, well you, I'm sure you, all your artists will be safe. And everything. I said, I'm not so worried about artists. They're so eager. Uh, they'll do yes anything. can't wait yeah i'm much more concerned about the audience uh, yes that will yes. simply be 
too afraid and already used to for a year to be not to, to be going out except yeah. for yeah. restaurants you know and that's a serious consideration it is it's it's the fear it's being but i think you know if people go on planes sit and i've gone to a number of planes because i've taken a few trips and you know you sit next to you hope that person either been vaccinated or took the test otherwise he wouldn't be on or this and that but basically you're breathing the same air and if it's a long flight boy oh boy you know yeah yeah mask yeah. no mask this and that so how is that less dangerous than sitting in the theater a, a good seat away from somebody you know when it's regulated and all that so it's a lot of it is psychological a lot of it is psychological it's, it's the way you see it and whether you feel that you really are that we all are social animals and there are certain moments in life we need to experience together mm -hmm. you know yeah. there is something right your your wonderful husband Heiner who's played in the Wiesbaden Orchestra all his life and now of course he has another profession another hobby which became a profession he's he deals with fantastic or uh, you know uh, early Rare books and music exactly exactly but he he knows what I'm talking about no matter how you know much we've taken it for granted but to make music together there's an energy there is exchange of emotions without a word being spoken that mm. cannot be substituted and for uh, in order to another conductor that i just talked this morning will be one of my uh uh future subjects and he said we just had 250 people at at, at, at our concert we were so thrilled yeah. but normally we would get a thousand and we'd say oh it's not full <laughs> no no, no. 50. For sure, yes. hallelujah! You know it's great. So hallelujah. maybe it's changed us. It's changed us in a good way. I always try to think that because I'm a kind of glass half full person. What have you, if anything, have you learned uh, from this long period of 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 inactivity, relative inactivity? I mean, activity online and this, but not being with people. Have you missed it? What have you learned about yourself, your own, uh, apart from being being sick and getting over it and all that? Yeah, that was relatively uninteresting. Well, I, I think I can um, pretty summarize it really well, simply because of an article I read this morning in one of our local papers. Well, not it's a national paper, but it's about creativity in general. And it's... Um, I found it so fascinating. I went running into the living room and said, look, look, this is, we got to tell that we got to tell everybody about this. Um, because it says that not only the musicians and the artistic, the humanities feed out of this general pool of art, but also all of the creations that happen in the world of science or finance or anything also feed off of this pool. There's a genetic, there's a collective energy and um, need to communicate, even if it's not on a conscious level, with these energies that are around us in our society. And it's like, a, if you take music out of the schools, you are not going to get better mathematicians are going to get worse mathematicians. Exactly. And if you take art out of the school, you're not going to get more business people. You're going to get worse business people because we're, this is a common pot of creativity. And I say, that's what's wrong with all of us right now. That's why we're tired. That's why we're cranky. That's why we're frustrated. It's because we're not tapping into this, uh, this, what they call the collective creativity of an entire people, if it's a nation or if it's a city, even if it's only a block or in a theater or in a concert hall, we're not tapping into an energy source anymore. We, we need batteries. We, we're not hooked up with a battery anymore. And this, it's just such a wonderful article. And I, you know, I, I'm preparing to use it as a thing to go to talk to people about taking music out of the schools, because look, 
this is this is science. This isn't like me saying music is good for all of us. This is science. And this also applies to our situation in Corona. The longer you keep us away from other people, the less creative we are. It's just how it works, you know? And it's not because our creativity is going away. It's because we're not charged anymore. Yeah. And we're not exchanging the energy. Part of this whole thing yeah. is, is, is the synergy that happens between two people, five people, ten, and so forth. Yeah. You know, it's that... Uh, that's why you know I can't wait to have as much, even even in this pandemic. I mean, you know, some of those things that I've been doing, the the, the distant recordings and everything. I mean, they, people feel when I send the music, when I send my record, and then they add to it, and everybody works from their homes. But then we have this collective thing, and it sounds like we are together in the same room. We're on different continents, you know, completely. Yeah. But it does work. It makes everybody just being, you know, in the same energy group. But to be in the same room, phew, that's an incredible army. Already. Yeah, that's, already. That, that, that is something I cannot wait to see them all. Uh, even one is at the rehearsal, but the other thing, just at the table, just talking and exchanging ideas and everything. I mean, you can sit at, uh, on all these meetings, you know, on Zoom, and you can hear, but everybody's just getting tired, and you know, and oh, of and course, no. it's like in a classroom, you know, when when the when the teacher's speaking, you, you're already making notes about something else or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. hard. It's yeah. hard to, to to concentrate. It's just yeah. Not and the longer it goes on, the worse it gets because we are not hooked in anymore. You know, we're not feeding off of this energy anymore. And that, you know, thank God, you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. Yeah, I and I. I'm a half, glass half full too kind of person. And I think that when people have the opportunity to go into the theater again, they're going to be, you know, killing each other for tickets because they just can't wait to, and, and they might not even be sure why it makes them feel better, but it does. It does. it does. You go out feeling better, no matter if it was a very sad opera, it doesn't matter, you know, or, or a piece you, you didn't even like that much. It's still, I've got something to talk about. I felt something, something's going on, you know, I'm with other people. I'm hooked into this thing, you know, this large battery yeah. with, that we all seem to have in common. It's also so fantastic. I mean, in this in this pandemic, I must have been affected in the way of maybe getting more sentimental. But when I hear a beautiful piece of music, you know, it just brings tears to my eyes. Just, oh, just I know. to be... You know, to be experiencing a great piece by Bach or by Mozart or Mendelssohn, it just moves me, you know, just to be uh, witnessing such genius, you know, such yeah. pure genius. And it's just so something that we need daily. Maybe that's a good thing, too, that we don't take these things for granted anymore. No. That you you go in and say, oh, look at those people. They're sitting next to each other and playing. Oh, my God. You know, it's just, yeah. I went to because um, they were rehearsing for an online streaming project. Um, you know, just two pianos, four singers, Brahms, Liebes, Lieder, Walzer. Cried through the whole thing. Yeah. Cried through the whole thing. The whole thing. I just, it was so beautiful. So listen to that. Listen to what they're doing with it. Oh my God. Oh, she's singing so well, you know, listen to that. You know, it was ridiculous. It was, you know, cause I hadn't heard anything live for a year. Just, you know? just streaming. Uh, or when I yeah. first, after six months, I was in Prague, you know, listening to the, you know, the last round I was judging, I was among the jury. And when the orchestra came out and then the choir came out and sang just the first pieces before they were, <gasps> Goosebumps. Yeah, and it's Goosebumps. just like yeah. unbelievable. The live orchestra with all yeah. the glory and that beautiful hall. Oh, my God, it's a good thing we had masks. We had to yeah. have just yeah, yeah. Just sobbing. Yeah. sobbing. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Just the, you know, and it's not just the age. I think it's it, it's for young people. It must be even even more more devastating than for than for us. And for them, I think it's very very important to keep. To keep focused on keep the faith. Yeah, yeah. Keep the faith. Because yeah. This will pass. This will pass. You know, and as, it will. And as my last guest last week, Gonzalo said, you know, everybody's just oh, it's so terrible. This this century, last century was pretty horrendous. 
<laughs> you know, a uh, you know, nuclear and a flu that took fifty and, million and people. So by many, the way, yeah, <laughs> nobody we've never had a century with more people killed by their yes. own, uh, you know, tyrants like Stalin yeah, yeah. and Holocaust and everything. And we all think, oh God, God all those good, good old days. Wait, nah, wait, not so much. <laughs> not yeah. so much. It's yeah. not as bad as this. So, no. On that optimistic note, I really yes. thank you, Nadine. Thanks so much for taking the time. And I wish we could visit again soon. In we East will. Now. We will. And of course, London, you know, we've, we've been, you know, visiting each other in the former, uh, in the previous life. But I'm in sure. the previous life, yes. Really. <laughs> <laughs> True. So I'm looking great. forward to it. Yeah, Keep my bed warm for me. <laughs> absolutely. And thanks so much. And in the meantime, okay. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And of course, you know that you need to, if you haven't yet, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I'll meet you in a week. Thank you, Nadine, so much. Stay safe. Stay safe.